Welcome to the Sira class. Today, inshallah, we will discuss the migration of uh, the uh, brotherhood between the immigrants and the Ansar. Now, after the Prophet ﷺ arrived Medina and after he established the masjid, he built the masjid, now there is another thing to take care of, which is the society itself, the social bond between the Muhajireen and the Ansar, the immigrants and the Ansar. Now, there were reasons <coughs> why the Prophet ﷺ decided to establish this relationship, this brotherhood. At their time, they used to belong to their tribes. So it was very rare that someone leaves his tribe his tribe, his city, and goes to another place. And even if he goes to another place, he will be considered always stranger. Always. You will not have the privilege like the people from that, from that village, from that tribe. So the Prophet ﷺ wanted to eliminate that. In order to have a strong society, strong community, everybody is with you, then you need to do this. You establish some kind of agreement. And this thing, the brotherhood between the Muhajirin and Ansar, it was the greatest brotherhood relationship that was known in history. The history of mankind never knew something like that. Even the philosophers, they imagined how would be the perfect city, the most virtuous city, like Aflaton and others. They did not even come to what happened in reality. They imagined things in their books. But this has happened at the time of the Messenger wasallam. You have poor people coming to you and they need your help. Now there is nothing forces you, obliges you, you don't have obligation to help them in everything. Because remember what are the terms of the agreement in the second pledge with the Messenger wasallam and the Ansar. It was to support the Prophet ﷺ, to protect him from the enemies, to help him call for this religion, for Islam. So there was nothing about helping everyone comes to Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ noticed that the Muhajireen need something. They left everything. They left everything behind. They became equal, but equal in poverty, equal in need. The rich, the noble one, and the poor one, the slave, all of them. Bilal was equal to Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, to Abdurrahman bin Auf, to the rich people. They were all equal, but in poverty. They did not have anything. They came and left everything. So the Prophet ﷺ felt that it is important to do this. Another thing, how many tribes already in Medina? Five. So you don't want to add another division, the immigrants. You want to unite them. You don't want to divide them. So instead of five, let's make them four. So the Prophet ﷺ called on the Muhajireen and the Ansar. Now how did it happen exactly? What was the nature of this brotherhood? Basically, how many immigrants came? What's the number? How many immigrants came? They were not many. They were 45. That's all. 45 immigrants. Each one was given to one of the Ansar, one of the families, to take care of him. So it was not difficult for the Ansar to take care of 45 Muhajireen. And that was the essence, that was the root brick in the Islamic State. When this relationship happened, the brotherhood between the Muhajireen and the Ansar, now they established the first strong community in Medina. There were terms, although these terms were not written, but everybody knew what to do. Like the Prophet ﷺ did not come to each Ansari and tell him, look, this is the Muhajiri, you have to do for him one, two, three, four things. They knew what to do already. And actually some people, they exceeded what they 
what they are told to do or what they should have done. Like Asad ibn Zurara, radiallahu anhu. Abdurrahman bin Auf, radiallahu anhu, he's from the immigrants, from the Muhajirin. Asad ibn Zurara from the Ansar. And again, the Prophet وسلم, considered the equity, who is equal to who, like this is a leader, so it's, it's appropriate for him to be a brother to a leader. So, Asad ibn Zurara, radiallahu anh, he was a leader in his people. The same thing, Abdurrahman Nauf was a very famous businessman in Mecca, but he has nothing now. So, Asad ibn Zurara, radiallahu anh, told him, I have two wives. Look at them, and the one that you like, I will divorce her, and you marry her after her idda. I will count how much I have, and I will divide it, and I will give, it, give you half of it. Now, we, unfortunately, we just only say it. Now, if someone comes and asks us 1% of what we have, maybe we don't give it. That's what he did willingly. The Prophet ﷺ did not tell him, you have to give him half of your money. You have to give him one of your wives. He did not tell him that. Look at the response from Abdurrahman bin Auf. Now, if someone told you, I have $5,000, come and take 2500 Do you take it or you say no? I mean, it's a gift. You should take it. Abdurrahman now said no. Look at the dignity of this companion, radiallahu anh. He said no. May Allah bless you, bless your money, bless your wives. Just show me the market. He liked, he liked making money for himself. He liked working. And they struggled. Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anh, he worked for a Jew. That Jewish man, he had a farm and he had a well. He had to go every day to the bottom of that well with a bucket, fill it with water and comes up. What's the payment? What's the wage? Every bucket, Ali Radilan fills it with water. He has one date. For every bucket, one date only. So if you go down 100 times, how much you will get? 100 dates. That's it. They did not complain and they did not say, Oh, Messenger of Allah, we need money to come from heaven. They were strong with what they had. So that was the brotherhood between the Muhajirin and the Ansar. Everyone took care of one of the Muhajirin. They were 45. So all of them who are taken care of. Now this is one issue solved. Now there is another issue. When the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, everybody was Muslim. All the, the uh, Aus and Al Khazraj were Muslims. All Medina embraced Islam, excluding the Jews. No, there were Mushrikeen still. Now, many of them accepted Islam, but many of them were still mushrikeen. Now, not everybody automatically in Medina accepted Islam. So we still have non-Muslims. And we still have the Jews. So what to do? As a leader, the Prophet ﷺ solved one issue. He built the masjid. He established the center for the Muslims. He established the brotherhood. He solved this issue. Now there is another issue. which is the Jews and the non-Muslims. For the Jews, the Prophet ﷺ made an agreement with them. And all the terms are mentioned in the book. So you need to memorize all these terms. Of them, the coexistence. You admit and you acknowledge that we have the right to live with you. And the same thing for them. You have the right to live with us. We have two different entities. We, we exercise our religion in freedom. That's one of the terms. Another term, that they should, they should be helpful to each other. Means they cannot, like Jews, they cannot help Quraysh against Muslims. Quraysh was the enemy of Islam now. Now remember Quraysh, after they knew that the Prophet ﷺ migrated 
They did not sit back and say, Alhamdulillah, we got rid of Muslims. No, because they feared that this new religion is expanding, is growing, and it will become a danger for us. So the Prophet ﷺ told the Jews that they have no right to, to support or to help Quraysh. If someone did something wrong from the Muslims, the Jews are not responsible. But if there was oppression, they should help each other. Okay? Because it's not our fault if you did something wrong to someone else. That's your problem. You have to solve it. But if something wrong happened to us, you should help us. So the oppressed should be helped. If there is a war to happen, both groups, Muslims and the Jews, they should help each other. I'm mentioning this because you will notice that every single item was breached by the Jews. Every single item was breached. So now, as a leader, you established your community, you enforced peace, you are ready to spread the Dawah. This is very important. Again, as I told you, we, we need to study each step that the Prophet ﷺ took in Medina carefully. To know why he did that. First, he built the masjid. Then he established the brotherhood. Always you start within your own self. You cannot start Dawah overseas while in your own area there is a severe problem. You start with your own people. Unless you feel that there is no way at all and you leave as the Messenger ﷺ did. So you start with your own people. You cannot have successful da'wah if there is a conflict going on. Imagine if a non-Muslim came to the masjid and he asked about something. He heard three or four different things. Each one is telling him different story. Would he like that? Would he accept Islam? He will say, which one should I follow? So, if a man came to the masjid of the Messenger وسلم, they will not tell him this is the way of the Muhajireen and this is the way of the Ansar. This is the way of Islam. That's it. The relationship that was established between the Muhajiri and the Ansari, the two brothers, it was stronger than the relationship with the families. Like if a Muhajiri died, who will inherit him? His brother from the Ansar. And the same thing. If Ansari died, one of the Ansar, and he has a brother from the Muhajirin, he will inherit him. That was one of the things, of the results of this brotherhood. So these are the terms of the agreement. Now, this is the situation. The Prophet ﷺ established the necessary things, the foundations, of each successful, peaceful community, but there are some hardships and there are some new challenges. One of them is hypocrisy. This is something was not known for Muslims before. In Mecca, Muslims were weak. They were minority. So there was no need for anyone to claim something and hide something else. Actually, it was the opposite. The Muslims, they used to hide their Islam. But when they moved to Medina, they used to announce that they are Muslims. They were proud of this religion. They are not minority anymore. They are a powerful group in Medina. There are some people who were not happy with this situation. They noticed that the Muslims are getting stronger and stronger. They established their masjid. They have properties, they have many things, so we have to be with them, to go with the flow. So what did they do? They announced or they, they claimed that they are Muslims, but they hid their disbelief. The most famous one of them is Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Again, why we don't have this issue in Mecca? The situation is totally different in Medina. In Medina, Muslims are not minority anymore. Muslims are not weak anymore. They are strong. There is envy going on from 
the non-Muslims. So they did not want to lose any privilege. They did not want to lose anything that the Muslims are enjoying. So they announced that they are Muslims. And Abdullah bin, bin Salul in particular, why he was the head of the hypocrites? He was the one who, uh... Because he was the one who was supposed to be the leader. Now he saw the Prophet ﷺ coming, getting the leadership, taking over. So he did not like that. We learn from this very important lesson. Challenges and seeking positions will not help da'wah. Our personal gains have to be taken away in order to have successful da'wah. Again, the example of the, the Adhan. Abdullah bin Zayd, he did not say, no, it is mine. I saw the dream. He did not do that. But Abdullah bin Ubayy bin Salul, he couldn't help it. He said, I am the leader of the Medina and I want to, stay, to remain the leader. So if he announced that he is not Muslim, he will lose many things. Because many of his followers accepted Islam. So he announced that he is a Muslim. So now, we have the Jews, we have the Muslims, we have the non-Muslims, and we have the hypocrites. Of course, the two biggest groups are Muslims and Jews. The non-Muslims are very few. Most of the Arab became Muslims, accepted Islam. Very few Jews accepted Islam, like Abdullah bin Salam and Ubay bin Ka'b radiallahu an. They were two rabbis and they accepted Islam. And we have the hypocrites also, it's not a majority. Because it is minority again, it was not known. It was not exposed to the Muslims. So these are the groups. Now, the Prophet ﷺ had to deal with new challenges. The first thing, again, now you took care of your own, own place. Now you know that there are other threats in the way. One of them, Quraysh. It will always be an enemy. So the Prophet ﷺ started establishing the army. Now, in any country, what are the foundations? What are the pillars of each successful society in, a, in any country? They teach this in administration. What, what do you have to have in order to get a good or a strong country. Land. You need the land, yes, yes. Military, yes. Military army, what else? Economy. Economy, that's it. Of course, you need the people. People, economy, army, military, and the place. Look at the countries nowadays. China, for instance. How powerful is China? China is a serious threat to America. Why? Economy now, now it is an economical threat. But before, like 20, 30 years ago, the economy was not the threat. The number of people was the threat. One billion, one-fifth of the world. They were one-fifth of the world. If you add to it the economy, Japan. Japan is not a big country. They don't have big land. Even the people, it's not that big country like China or India. But they had very strong economy. So it is a factor in the world decisions. United States, again, the strongest army in the world. That's why it is like the policemen of the world, plus the economy as well, plus the land. <laughs> so you see, this is, these are the pillars of every successful country. Now in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ had the center, the land, the people, the followers, and he needed to establish the army. Now in Mecca, they were abused. The Muslims were abused. Some of them got killed. Some of them tortured. But they were not allowed to fight back. 
even now in Medina, the purpose of having people, mujahideen, companions in the army is only for defense purposes. Because again, Mecca will not keep quiet. The kuffar will not remain silent. They had to do something. So the Prophet ﷺ did not wait until they come and attack Medina. Again, this is the wisdom. You know that you are getting a threat from this area. Constantly, time after time after time, what do you do? You prepare or you ignore it? No one would tell you, just ignore it, forget it. You have to prepare. And that's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did. Therefore, you know why the Prophet ﷺ sent some groups of people, small groups of, of Mujahideen to go outside Medina to secure these areas because you don't want to wait until people come and attack you in your own place. So that's what the Messenger ﷺ did. And here, I will stop. I will, I, we were supposed to, uh, to read something, but I will leave the reading for you. You have assignment for today. It is reading. So we will stop here.